Welcome. Good morning. We're so glad that you've joined us here at Westover Church this morning. My name is Michael Troutman, and I get the opportunity to serve on the communications team here at Westover. If you're our first-time guest, I want to say a special welcome to you. And you might be wondering, what's this bag he's holding? This bag, you will find these out at our hub. That's that area right there in the middle of our lobby. If you're a guest with us this morning, we'd love for you to stop by. And I want to invite you to stop by that area this morning. We'd love to just put a face with a name, introduce ourselves, answer any questions that you might have, and give this gift to you as our thank you for uh, visiting here this morning. As I said, we're honored that you have chosen to spend a part of your Sunday with us. For anybody who has questions this morning, I want to point you in that same direction to our hub where you can find out what happens in and around this place called Westover and also get any questions answered about our purpose to develop mature followers of Jesus Christ. That is why we exist as a church, to come alongside people as they take steps in maturing in their walk with Christ. This morning, I have a number of things to put on your radar. And to do so, I'm going to highlight the banners that we have scrolling on our Westover website. If you go to westoverchurch.com, right there at the top of the screen, you will see a number of banners that are scrolling. One of them, first one, is Fall Startups. Now, I could stop right there because if you click on that, you're going to see information that covers a huge variety of what goes on here from next gen to com uh, life communities. I'm talking things like Awana dates, uh, high school fall retreat signups. Shortly, there will be a middle school fall retreat sign up there. You'll find men's and women's kickoff events. That's Flourish and Man Meal. You'll also find things about Promotion Sunday. I'll get to that in a second. You'll find a section talking about Rooted. Rooted is another banner that you will see scrolling. Rooted groups are starting this fall, and there are going to be groups for men. There are going to be, going to be groups for women. Those groups will come out of the fall uh, startup events. There's going to be, in mid-September, a small group startup. That's September 18th. You can have that date in the back of your mind. There's a small group startup. The groups that come out of that will be focused on Rooted as well. Now, you might be asking yourself, Michael, what's Rooted? I'm not going to tell you. Can you guess where to go to get information about Rooted? On the website, the banner, yes. If you click on the rooted banner, it will take you, it will redirect you to a page where you will find all the details that you need to know about rooted. There's some video testimonies there. We'd love for you to check that out. You'll notice around the building that there are rooted flyers with a QR code. You can scan that and that'll redirect you there as well. Last thing I want to let you know about is a banner that says Promotion Sunday. Promotion Sunday is next week. Can you believe we're already there? We're about to head into September. What's Promotion Sunday? That's the Sunday that those in next-gen programming, birth through high school, move up a grade level. Now, it's a little bit of a hectic Sunday, figuring out where you belong or where your kids go. However, we will be here to help you figure that out. You might just want to build a, an extra minute or two into your Sunday routine next week, but we'll be here walking alongside you to help out. Again, Broad overview of lots of things happening. I want to point you to our website, westoverchurch.com. Click on the banner of whatever you might have heard this morning, and that will redirect you to where you can find more details and information. Sound good? Amen. This morning I'm excited we get to hear from Pastor Tony, and he is our high school pastor. He's going to be sharing about serving. If you think back to last fall, we went through a series titled One Another, where we looked at what it looks like for us, the body of Christ, the Westover family, to one another well, living out, serving, and loving each other as we live out um, or as we live into our gifts and abilities. And then throughout 2022, we've paused at different times to hear about how that's playing out in our Westover family specifically. And this morning, I get the opportunity of dialoguing with a couple from here from Westover, and you guys get to listen in on this. Would you welcome Richard and Rachel Westover to the stage with me?
Richard and Rachel, welcome. Thanks for being here with me this morning. Y'all doing all right? We are. One yes. service down, one more. That's right. <laughs> I'm excited for this opportunity that we just get to hear a little bit about this couple. When I think of a couple that embodies serving, I mean, it's you guys. Rachel, you have served in Mops. You've served with Alana. You've served with Westover Kids. For 14 years, she has called people who have visited here at Westover just to connect with them. Richard, you on the other hand, you've, you've led financial peace in, in past years here at Westover. Uh, you've, um, you currently serve as one of our deacons. I mean, I could spend the next several minutes just building out this resume of how you guys have served here at Westover. But I know that's not your heart, the recognition of that. I do want our body to hear an opportunity of the heart behind it. So share a little bit about that heart. What, what compels you to serve? Why serve? Yeah, so thank you, Michael. So a verse that comes to mind, uh, 1 Peter 4.10, where it says, each one should use the gifts he has received to serve others, uh, resonates with us. Um, and, and how we feel about serving is it's really given us a front row seat to kind of see what uh, God is doing in ministry, right? Um, through the lives of others, but it's also impacted us in a really positive way as well, exposing us to ministry areas we may not have otherwise been exposed to. Um, I know, for example, Michael mentioned we've served in Financial Peace, which is a great uh, ministry, Dave Ramsey's class. Um, back in 2008, we were in a life community here. They went through a personal finance series. Um, and during that time, uh, we were kind of sparked with an interest of, oh, this is something to be pretty cool, this personal finance thing. So fast forward a couple years, the class, the Financial Peace University class was offered, and we jumped on the leadership team of that in 2010 and served uh, over the course of the next nine years in 10 different classes. It was a great opportunity for us to serve together um, and just to be exposed to something, again, that we didn't probably would not have thought we would have served in prior to that. I was going to say, one of my favorite quotes from um, a former life community leader, Jim Downing, was, God doesn't need our ability. He needs our availability. And Richard and I have committed using our availability, giving it to God, and trusting that he will give us the ability to serve. Did you guys hear that? God doesn't need our ability. He needs our availability. And what Richard just said is, Serving over the years has given you guys a front row seat to see how the Lord is at work in and around the Westover family. In that front row seat that you had to, to see, how, how has serving impacted you guys? I was going to say, one example I think of is um, several years we have done the Valentine Grams for the widows here at Westover. And I just thought that would be, oh, that's a simple way we could serve. It's been great for our family. Not only, I was thinking, we'll be a blessing to others, but in return, it was really a blessing to us. We've met Ann Griffin over the past couple of years and just gotten to know her, and we've been able to send cards to her. She sent cards to the kids, and it's just been a true blessing to really get to just visit with her and get to know her. Yeah, and so we, uh, another area we've served, actually right now we serve on the leadership team of the Parents at Westover Life Community Group, um, which is open to parents uh, with kids from birth all the way through high school. Um, and it actually meets at 1030 in W201 every Sunday morning. So next Sunday, come at nine o'clock and then come check us out. <laughs> um, but no, it's, that's been a, a great ministry opportunity for us uh, to serve on that leadership team. We've done community, connected in community with other parents. Um, shared praises, prayer requests, and it's just been a huge blessing for us to be involved in that. Um, another ministry area I've been involved in more recently was VBS the last couple years. Um, I actually got to play a character called the Gospel Hunter, um, which was kind of fun just to get up there and introduce the lesson for the day, talk to the kids about the memory scripture verses, um, and just to have kids come up to me throughout the week and say, oh, we recognize you as the gospel hunter. And so obviously it was cool to see the impact it had on them, but that was a real blessing for me just to be able to participate in that. Something I, you know, five years ago, I would have said, there's no way I'm going to dress up as a character that looks like Indiana Jones and, and talk to kids about, um, you know, scripture verses, memory verses and things like that. So it was really cool. So church family, the next time you see Richard in the hallway, you can just point and yell, there's the gospel hunter. I expect to hear that like those words. <laughs> Now, I know we just ran through a bunch of things as we look towards the fall that are about to start up. And, and those things don't just happen. I mean, we need people from the Westover family to, to get engaged, to, to get in the game and, and help with what happens here on a weekly basis. 
there's got to be people here. I, I know that there are people here who maybe haven't taken that step yet or on the, on the cusp of I have, I have that availability, maybe not the ability, but I'm trusting that God will give, equip me with that ability. What, what would you say to the people who are right there on the edge? Great question. So I think the thing to, to keep in mind is try not to fall into the trap of, hey, oh, we're a larger church. Somebody else will serve in that area that maybe I feel called to. Somebody else will do that um, because God may have equipped you uniquely to serve in a certain area that you may be a blessing to others, but also it could have a huge impact on your own spiritual journey and maturing in your faith. So again, just don't fall into that trap of somebody else may do it. Um, I know for us, um, when we first came into a life community in 2007, um, we were greeted warmly by a couple, Jeff and Casey Chesson, that meant a lot to us. Um, and so you never know the impact that you can have on other people um, when you serve. And so one, one other thought we had with this, when it comes to, to ministry and serving, don't just be a spectator, be willing to be a participant. Anything you wanna add to that? When in doubt, just serve. That was our 10 second version of this dialogue. When in doubt, just serve. Don't, don't just be an observer on the sideline, be a participant. I know this is not the heart of this, but thank you guys for how you have modeled what it looks like to serve uh, in the Westover family, to, to be a model of that, that's incredible. Church family, can we thank them for being here this morning? Church, would you stand with us as we sing together? Psalm 107 says that he, God, satisfies the longing soul, the hungry soul he fills with good things. Let's thank him this morning. I search the world. He couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures and faith.
we thank you that you turn our ashes into beauty, that you redeem us, that you rescue us all for your glory. Amen, church. Let's think of what he's done for us.
one defense my righteousness oh God how I need you as we normally do every month at Westover today we are going to receive our Lord's table as a family if you need the elements, uh, the ushers are here. Uh, just lift your hands and they will be uh, willing to give you the elements. Christ calls the bread his body and the cup the new covenant in his blood. He wants to remind us that just as bread and drink nourishes the physical and temporal life, in the same way, his crucified body and pour out blood are the true food and drink of our souls for eternal life. He wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, sharing in his true, uh, true body and blood as sure, surely as our mouth receives the bread and drink. And that all of our sufferings and all of his sufferings and obedience are as definitely ours as we personally suffer and may satisfaction for our sins. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I think it would be appropriate for us to pause and examine our hearts, just as Paul encourages the Corinthians to do when he said, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Why? Because considering our own sin and the wrath of God on it, be sure that we humble ourselves in repentance before God. We should examine our hearts because to be sure that we trust in Jesus alone for our salvation and that we believe our sins are forgiven wholly by grace for the sake of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. 
And we are to examine our hearts, our conscience, to be, to be sure that we resolve to live in faith and obedience before our Lord and in love and peace with our neighbors. Just take a few moments and examine your heart. Holy Spirit, help us to turn away from our sin and cling to the cross. May we hide in the wounds of Jesus and find shelter in his side. Cause us to place all of our hopes in the powerful blood of our Savior and his perfect righteousness in our place. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with you, God, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. For while we were still weak, at the right time, God died for the ungodly. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. As we prepare our bread this morning, just think of the punishment Christ received. so that we may be forgiven and have a relationship with Christ. Just thank Christ for his death. As the Lord's on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now take eat. Remember and believe that the body of our Lord was given for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Give thanks and eat. Jesus. As the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, um, took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. It was his blood who justified us and his righteousness were pour upon our lives so that we now can have a relationship with him. We have a right standing with God. Now take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord was shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Give thanks and drink. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, almighty God, and all Father. Cause us to find overwhelming delight in the salvation you have given us through Christ Jesus. Open our eyes more and more to see our great high priest crushed for us and now pleading for us before your throne. May we treasure his love and believe with all of our hearts that nothing can separate us from that everlasting love. Give us such great confidence in the gospel that we run joyfully 
to you in the midst of our weakness. To hear your pardoning voice and feel the ardent and passionate embrace for our true Father. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Good morning, church. Oh, man. I do not know how I got this boondoggle of uh, speaking to you this morning about service and humility. Uh, but, you know, you ask a pastor to talk about service, and that's kind of pretty easy. But it makes it seem like I'm going to hit it out of the park, and it's just going to be really great. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but I am human, um, and I'm going to miss some things. So uh, just email me later. I'm sure you'll do that. So. Uh, I also wanted to apologize right off the bat. If we haven't met yet, my name is Tony, and I have the privilege and honor of serving your high school students as their high school pastor. Uh, and I am preemptively apologizing because I might use some vernacular up here uh, that you all might not be used to, and I'm not talking about the Koine Greek. Uh, remember, I am the high school pastor, and uh, I, you know, speak to them in a particular way so that I can relate to them. And also, as I'm contractually obligated to tell you, I come from California. Um, just kidding. That's not in my contract, though they wish that it was so that I would stop talking about it. So in order to make a smooth transition from that disclaimer, let us pray together. Loving, beautiful Father, I give you all of the glory this morning, God. This is not about me. I pray, God, for less of me and more of you. Holy Spirit, fill me up with you. Speak through me this morning, and it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, as we're nearing the completion of our series, Life and Rhythm, I wanted to let you all know that it's our desire that by walking through these rhythms or spiritual disciplines that you would be inspired and encouraged to practice them yourselves. And we're going to get into God's word in just a moment, but I want to begin with a bit of Greek. Uh, the word used in the New Testament for ministry is this word called diakonia. Say it with me, diakonia. Very good. First service, I didn't really hear them, but y'all are pretty good. Uh, it's a similar word to this word diakonos, which, uh, which translators have turned into the word that we have in English for deacon. Oh my gosh, y'all are so good. So diakonia in its essence means service, okay? So every time you hear the word ministry in this next quote, I want you to hear service. So Warren and David Wearsby wrote in their book, Making Sense of the Ministry, I quote, the foundation of ministry is character. The nature of ministry is service. The motive for ministry is love. The measure of ministry is is sacrifice. The authority of ministry is submission. The purpose of ministry is the glory of God. The tools of ministry are the word of God and prayer. And the privilege of ministry is growth. The power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. And the model for ministry is Jesus Christ, end quote. And I agree with Warren and David about the nature of service. I believe that it requires things like character, love, sacrifice, submission, it requires a soli deo gloria attitude. That's for you Latin majors out there. That's glory to God alone. That kind of an attitude. It requires the exclusive use of scripture and prayer as your tools. It requires the power of the Holy Spirit. And most importantly, service requires the model given to us by Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that the model given to us for service in particular is illustrated so well in John chapter 13. When Jesus turned the prevailing Jewish ideology of power on its head by doing the work of a house slave. When he washed his disciples' feet. So if you have your Bible with you, turn with me to the gospel according to John chapter 13. And while you're doing that, let me summarize what my prayer is for our time this morning. Number one. We're going to exegete scripture. That means to draw out, to, to, to lead out this passage in John and hopefully come away with an understanding of just how radical this, this act of washing feet was. I would like you to understand the direct relationship between service and humility. And that humility is exemplified in Christ's teaching and actions. Number two. I would like to encourage you with what I've seen because I know that there are people in this church who have been at Westover since they were in diapers. 
And I believe that I come looking at Westover with fresh eyes because, again, I'm from California. Uh, enough of that. Um, and there are many positive and beautiful things that are happening in the life of this church here. And I would like to thank and highlight those activities. Number three, I would pray that you would be convicted enough to act out the grace that you've received in Christ Jesus, that you would engage in service. And as we'll see, service to God is different to how the world views literally everything. In particular, how the world views power, accolades, and reciprocation. And what I mean by reciprocation, it's this idea that you all know of, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Or I'm going to do this, but what can I get out of you? And the title of my message this morning is No Thanks. Oh, yes, I got to laugh. Because as servants of Christ, we sometimes get no thanks. And we also expect no thanks. We do not serve because we're looking for something in return. We serve because we've received more than we can ever give back. Now let me read the word of God in John chapter 13. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 and then go down to 12 through 17 for our purposes this morning. So hear the word of God. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with that towel. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. That's the word of God. Richard Foster, in his oft-quoted book in this series, Celebration of Discipline, said this, As the cross is the sign of submission, so the towel is a sign of service. End quote. Here Jesus demonstrates for his disciples what true humility and service actually looks like. And that looks like a towel. From the very beginning of this chapter, John describes the events as they unfolded. And John describes the setting, right? It's Passover. That's what he begins with. And the importance of this Jewish festival cannot be understated. This was a time when families were gathered together. They were trained and brought up to remember the Passover, to remember how God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And every part of the Passover meal was to commemorate exactly what God has done. And we all need reminders because God literally describes his chosen people as a stiff-necked people. We forget how we got to where we are. And all that to say that Jesus, in this important Jewish festival, should have been with his family. But the 12 were his family now. And that includes Judas. So he was there, and Jesus knew that his hour had come. So John says that Jesus loved them to the end. The, the word that, there that's love is, is agapao. And that literally means much love. It's a uber love. It's a super kind of love. And for Jesus, having much loved them to the end alludes to the laying down of his life, which he knew he was about to do. So to love completely, according to Jesus, means to love to the end of someone's life. To love completely doesn't mean I'm just going to love them until they make me mad. <laughs> he loved them to the end, which points to the cross. Another note about Passover is that Jesus, knowing his end was near, was about to mirror what was happening in Jewish households during the Passover, that a lamb was to be slain and his blood spread on the doorposts so that God's wrath would pass over them and be saved. And how appropriate of a time for this event of foot washing to take place, that Jesus was preparing to pass over from this world to sit at the right hand of God. And by Jesus' blood, it would be spread on the doorposts of our heart so that God's wrath would pass over us as well. 
Verse 3 says that Jesus knew that the Father gave all things into his hands. He was so secure in that that he was able to wash their feet, including the feet of the one who would betray him, Judas, right? So during supper, Jesus rose from like the ground, because that's where they were eating. And John says that he laid aside his outer garments, he took it off, and then took a towel, <clears throat> then tied it around his waist. Jesus then poured water into a tub, and then he began to do the humiliating work of washing his disciples' feet, <clears throat> then wiped them with the towel that was around his waist. Jesus' act of foot washing is something that a Gentile house slave would do. In fact, according to Jewish law, if a Jewish man fell onto hard times and he sold himself into slavery, he could not be compelled to wash his master's feet. Foot washing was a lowly task that was often performed by a female Gentile house slave. It was actually something that a wife would do for her husband to show her husband love. A children would do it to their parents. A disciple would do it for their teacher. And what Jesus was doing was a highly intimate affair. And Jesus gave voice to the fact that his beloved disciples did not understand what he was doing exactly. In fact, the part that I didn't read was when Peter basically yelled at Jesus. Peter said, you shall never do that. And Peter lacked humility in that moment, as we all know. Peter was still stuck in the past. He was stuck in the, the, the ancient idea that he'd grown up believing and living that, that honor came before everything. And he wasn't going to let his rabbi and Lord do the work of a slave. He wasn't going to let Jesus dishonor himself. And Jesus in that moment asked the question, do you know what I have just done for you? And Jesus reiterates to his disciples that yes, he is rabbi, just like they say. He is rabbi and Lord. He then says, if I then your Lord and rabbi have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. So the model for service we have now, which is personified in Christ Jesus, and the washing of feet is the model that is built upon radical humility. And when I say radical, I mean that's a 180 degree turn from what they were doing. When I was a little kid, radical was like the cool thing to say. Oh man, that's totally radical. Maybe y'all didn't have that out here, but I was from California. So they said that all the time. That's totally rad, dude, you know. But, but being radical was 180 degrees different from what they were doing. Like when, when the disciples saw what Jesus was doing, it blew their minds. So this radical humility is the model that we must follow when we serve others. The humility shown by Christ, the downright debasement of himself, was totally counter to the prevailing culture. It turned everything that they knew upside down. And this radical humility pointed to Jesus' ultimate humiliation on the cross. It pointed to Jesus' eventual sacrifice on Calvary. And if you think about the Hellenized Roman culture of Jesus' time, from the Jews to the Gentiles, they lived on the, life, the, the basis of death before dishonor. And Jesus just lowered himself, just humbled himself, to the same level as a Gentile house slave. And for people in that culture, in the prevailing culture, seeing Jesus do something like that was dishonorable. It was shameful. When I say it blew their minds, you have no idea. But this humility all points to the humiliation and humility of the cross. And Jesus said this in Matthew 20. He said, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That, my friends, is radical humility. Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah King, to ride on that white horse and destroy Israel's enemies. He didn't come to be served like a king. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Near the end of this display in verses 14 and 15, he says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now, some churches have foot washing as an ordinance. It's on the same level as baptism and the Lord's Supper, right? Imagine if we came to Westover Church and Pastor Elliot did communion. He's like, all right, everyone, break out the basins. We're going to wash one another's feet. But Jesus didn't say, do what I did exactly, right? He said, do as I did. He wasn't saying, do exactly this, foot washing. 
He was saying, this radical humility that I have just displayed for you, this is the model that you should have for the rest of the world. In the New Testament, when Scripture describes the word servant, the Greek word is usually this word called doulos. Say doulos. Doulos. That's doulos, not doulos. Whoever says doulos, correct them. That's doulos, right? I'm sure you've heard the, the term or heard the loan word doula. You know, you've heard of doula. It's someone who attends to birth matters. Y'all didn't know this, but three of our four children were born at home to a midwife. There's no MD present at all. We had a doula once, and she was, she was all right. But anyways, that, that word doulos is servant. And most of the time, like, that's how it's translated. But I believe a more apt translation would be slave. And we definitely recoil when we hear the word slave because reasons, right? <laughs> but in many cultures, the first century peoples were no different. Using the word doulos as a self-descriptor was a form of honor. To say that you were a slave or a servant for something or someone displayed great honor to the person that you loved. It illustrated to the reader the level of devotion you had for your Lord. Paul in Romans and Philippians calls himself a slave of Christ. James, Jude, and Timothy are all self-described slaves of Christ. And the language used by those apostles is obviously not for the faint of heart. But I believe that the language they use denotes a seriousness to the call to follow Christ. According to the example given by Jesus, service through a kingdom, biblical lens requires radical humility. And Jesus' example, this example of washing feet, of radical humility, that means he's asking not for just a little bit of us. I believe he's asking for our whole lives. Serving God is not a job for the casually interested, as was displayed in the interview here. Jesus in Matthew 16, 24 says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And I don't need to go into the Greek to explain to you how serious that call is. And anyone in that time period would recognize what a cross was for. It was a death sentence. And we understand it too. Take up your cross means to give your life. So God requires that service to him be a priority and not a hobby. Something that you do to pass the time. Or something you only do when you're interested. Only to throw it away when you're bored. You do not, you know, I moved, right? So we have a whole bunch of boxes that we haven't yet unpacked. Um, and you do not want to, I don't even want to go into the boxes full of stuff and hobbies that I used to have. God doesn't want us to use service and have it be relegated to boxes that we don't open when we move. He's asking for our whole lives. He doesn't want servants who offer him leftovers after their other commitments. And it's not a short-term responsibility because his kingdom will never end. He's trying to train us. He's trying to teach us this. When I found out that when the new heaven and earth come here, that we are going to serve. There will be street sweepers in the new heaven and earth. There will be politics. There will be governance in the new heaven and earth. And it's going to be happening for a really long time. So we better get used to this idea of being slaves to Christ, to being servants of people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleships, said this, quote, when Christ calls a man he bids him come and die, end quote. The call to serve Christ can sometimes pollute our mind with highfalutin images of martyrs who fearlessly face death. But I believe that it's, mar, it's uh, far more common that Christ's call to death is more like a death by a thousand cuts. It's not glamorous or glorious, but it's in the shadows, washing dishes in ambiguity. Donald Whitney in his book on spiritual discipline said this, quote, We're drawn to the appeal of service when it holds out the promise of bold adventure, but repelled when it means, as it more often does, feeling banished to serve Christ in a dreary corner of a seemingly inconsequential place. To have served Jesus by walking with him during his three-year ministry would have been a glorious adventure. I agree. 
to have served him three years earlier as his sweeper and saw sharpener in the carpenter shop wouldn't have been as appealing, end quote. And I know it's kind of strange saying this as a pastor who regularly preaches on a stage, not like this, but someone like me to be talking about serving in the shadows. I know it's kind of odd. And the call to serve may be as public as this, but more often the call to serve means you will be relegated to changing diapers in the nursery. Shout out to those who change diapers in the nursery. Give them a hand. Thank you so much. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You should probably wash them. Uh, but serving can be as thankless as washing dishes after everyone had gone home and forgotten about you. But I want to guarantee you, listen to this, God sees the larger hidden part of what you do for his bride. And sometimes you receive no thanks, no thanks at all. But that's not why you do it, is it? And in the past week, I've, I've had the opportunity to encourage some of my team and the Next Gen team, the high school team, and it was just got me thinking about how service to God and ministry in particular is such a strange thing. Um, let me tell you a story. My last church, our, C, our lead pastor, we were cleaning up after an event. It was a small church. And uh, we both go for the closet to go in, the, ba uh, in the, the supply room, and we both reach for the vacuum at the same time. And I go, oh, I'll let you take that. And he goes, no, no, you go ahead. So I go, thank you. And I was very happy about it. And he goes, you know why? You like vacuuming? And I never thought about it before. I really do like vacuuming. I like painting, doing all things like that. The reason why people in ministry love to do things like vacuuming and painting is because we can see a problem and then we can fix it. Because so much of what we do in ministry, and I'm talking to you here who serve faithfully every single week, week in and week out, so much of what you do, you cannot see the progress of. If we are blessed we are lucky we get to hear some of it. But most of the time, we will never know until eternity. Sometimes we can't see the short-term results of the work that we do in service to God. But we are not focused on the here and now. We should be focused on eternity. And don't let the lack of observable progress discourage you. But, but, but church, be encouraged knowing that we are being used by God to do his work. I always say that the, the worst day on the job in ministry is better than the best day on the job anywhere else. And I've worked at some really terrible places. <laughs> Service can also mean meeting very practical needs. Service can mean running errands for someone, providing transportation, driving the church minibus, right? Mowing someone's lawn. And I love mowing my lawn most of the time. Feeding pets. Watering plants. Sometimes service means simply being with someone in their time of need, where you just bring a meal and you just stay around. There's a Jewish tradition called sitting shiva. When someone is mourning the loss of a loved one, people just come over to their house. They're dressed in, in mourning clothes. They cover mirrors because the person in mourning should not be concerned with their physical appearance. And the visitors come and they sit on low stools to show how they've been brought low. Sometimes just being with someone is service. Sometimes service means inviting this family from California to a cookout or a Bible study. And when I tell you that this church and the people in it are an answered prayer, I don't know if you all know what it's like to pray for something for years upon years upon years. But the simple invitation to a cookout, simple invitation to the lake, a pool party, a dinner, um, that, that means the world to me and my family. And y'all are an answered prayer. That's some of what service looks like. And service to God isn't about self-glorification, but it's about God's glorification. And when talking about serving, the topic of spiritual gifts will inevitably come up. And I want to tell you that, yes, identifying your spiritual gift is fun, but I believe that you don't need to wait to serve before you can name your gift. In fact, I believe in addition to Scripture, the best way to identify your gift is to serve, right? As Rachel Westover said, that God doesn't need our ability. He just needs our availability. You can find out what your gift is by simply serving first. 
And then you could also discover what your gift isn't, right? Some of you may have raised your hand, like, I changed diapers and I knew that wasn't for me. And the gift that God has given to me is encouragement. And I know that it's a gift, uh, gift from God because being encouraging is actually not my natural inclination. Ask my parents, <laughs> and they'll tell you that I'm argumentative and I'm always pushing the envelope. And if you could read my mind, if you could have read my mind before I became a believer, you'd be shocked at how discouraging I could be. And I don't know if your gift is teaching. I don't know if it's giving, leading, mercy, wisdom, faith, discernment, or hospitality. My desire for you this morning is that you would search the scriptures for what the gifts are and engage in practice and radical, humble service to discover what that gift is. And you can also consult Pastor Google. I heard he's pretty knowledgeable for a list of spiritual gifts and where to find them in scripture, but I prefer that you just read your Bible. But I love using my gift. But remember, your gift that God has given to you isn't for your gain. I mean, I don't think I can get rich from being encouraging. I've never tried. But it's not for your gain. It's for God's glory. So Whitney says, service that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Service should cost us something. God is, is asking for our lives. He's looking for sacrifice. He's looking for humble servants. If we want to make an impact into this world, we need to give ourselves to others. Now let me tell you a personal story. When, uh, when I was interviewing for this job, I started the interview actually in California. There it is again. Is anyone keeping track? Someone will tell me later. But when I was in California, we started this process. We're driving literally across the country, um, and I was anticipating this Westover church. This was the church that I was most excited to interview for. It was the church I was most excited to visit. And when we visited, you know, we come into this giant church, and we didn't know where to go. We actually ended up on the, the, the middle floor, not the basement, but we ended up on the middle floor. And then we, we just started walking somewhere, and then we found the boat. And at the boat, we found a young lady named Kayla Dawson. And Kayla Dawson signed us in. She, like, put us in the computer, all six of us. And while she was doing that, the computer did what? What do you think it did? It broke. Of course it did. So she's like, I'm so sorry. It's restarting right now. I was like, don't worry, sister. Like, I've heard it all before. Don't worry. Kayla Dawson was amazing. She signed us all in. And then a lady by, Jeannie, uh, by the name of Jeannie Church came and took us everywhere we needed to go because our kids are all different ages and they were used to going to church Sunday school together, but they were all in different um, schools, so they, they needed to, we needed to follow Jeannie Church. We also noticed that regular churchgoers were also very welcoming when we visited, and I saw a lot of people with name tags, right, serving in every part of the ministry, and this was startling considering the last couple churches that I've worked at. And also, because I was interviewing for the high school pastor, I was also sort of having my mind tuned in on high school students. So I saw a lot of high school students, of people of high school age in the audience, and I thought that this was an issue. But then I was humbled when I found out why later on in the interview process. There's a, a tradition that Westover has called Fuse Serve. Fuse is the name of the high school ministry. And Fuse Serve is something they've been doing for a long time. And over 50 students and counting we have more than that serve in every single aspect almost of a Sunday morning. That's amazing. That is a value that I wanted to keep. Project Serve, 130 people this year serving a half a dozen ministries. Happens every year. Ask someone who's been on Project Serve and they'll tell you how incredible it is. What I've seen from the moment we stepped on campus and to now, some five months after joining the staff, I've seen the hands and feet of Jesus attached to regular people just like you. I've spoken to staff members and ministry leaders about how the pandemic shaped and perhaps also shrunk their ministries too. And in particular, how it affected the volunteer corps. And what I've received from them is an attitude of absolute gratitude for those faithful servant leaders who are true blue, who have stuck through the trials and tribulations of a global pandemic. So on their behalf, I would like to thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for staying true, for being here and committed to the church that you love. Because everything you see here on a Sunday morning doesn't happen by osmosis or natural selection or macroevolution or whatever you want to call it. It takes the dedication and time and sweat equity 
and devotion of people who are so in love with Jesus that they are compelled to serve in any way that they can. And we would love it if you could serve at the church you might call home here at Westover. And my desire and prayer actually is just that you would serve anywhere, somewhere. I think you should serve here because I love it here. And also, as a side note, when we visited, after we visited, we knew that no matter what, we would go to Westover Church. Even if I got hired somewhere, I told Tiffany, I was like, it'll be kind of awkward if I get hired at another church and I tell them that my home church is actually Westover Church. <laughs> so thank you, okay? That's the encouragement. Here comes the challenge. Richard said it earlier, 1 Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Jesus promised to help in John 14, the Holy Spirit. And we're not to hide that help under a bushel. We are to use it to serve others. Moses said in Deuteronomy, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. So my challenge to you this morning, saints, is to engage in service at Westover Church. If you're here and visiting for the first time or even the fifth time, please hear that I'm not necessarily talking to you. Though if the Holy Spirit is nudging you to serve, please do so. And I'm really talking to the regular attenders who only believe that they, the most that they can do is attend. According to Scripture there and many other places, God has not planted you to sit here on the sidelines. And let me close with this story. There's a woman named Cynthia Vaughn, and she works in our library here at Westover Church. If you didn't know we had a library, yes, we do. And there's also another woman named Diana Brown, and she serves as our community life director on staff. So Cynthia was like in a grocery store, Harris Teeter or what have you, uh, and then Diana Brown was also in this place. And they got to talking somehow, and Cynthia was like, yeah, I go to Westover Church. And Diana's like, no way, I serve there. And she goes, where do you serve, Cynthia? And we find out later that actually Diana's usual question when she encounters someone from Westover is, where are you connected? But for some reason, the Holy Spirit put it in her to ask the question, where are you serving? And Cynthia confessed to Diana that she had an inkling to serve in the library. And then Diana held her accountable to that by sharing resources to help her serve God in that inkling that she had. So my question to you, church, this morning is, do you have an inkling to serve? Has God been whispering to you? Perhaps he's been yelling at you to serve like he did for me and then like he did for Cynthia. And I would challenge you to accept that call this morning. If I'm describing you, when you leave this worship center, you're going to go to the welcome area. You can't miss it. And then there, talk to someone about getting connected with the ministry. I know we are looking for people. So in closing, let's recap. Jesus' humility, his example of humility in washing the feet of his disciples is our model for service. This is how we do everything in radical humility. And I believe that Westover Church is doing really great. But I would like to see everyone have an opportunity to be transformed from the inside out by serving God with one another. And Christ's example, especially his sacrifice on the cross, is the reason why we must serve. And I'm going to pray, and we're going to close with this song, and I think it's appropriate considering we just were at the Lord's table together, remembering Jesus' blood and his sacrifice on the cross. We're going to sing a song called Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood Applied. Let me pray. Loving Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness. I thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would fill each and every person in here with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that they would be compelled and convicted to serve your body. Father, I give you all of the glory, and we give you glory in this song. In Jesus' name, amen. And stand and sing with us. a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The creature was far too wide. 
from the far side of the cask, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul, oh, the first time I had Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our benediction this morning comes from 1 Timothy 4, 
verses 7 and 8, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And together as a church family, we say, 